Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Welcome to another scintillating installment of uh, Press Club South Africa. Today we have uh, Carl Niehaus, a person and a man who needs no introduction. But fortunately, today we are going to be engaging him on uh, a range of issues, including some that are biographical. And the idea is also to make sure that whoever appears here, we ensure that uh, their history is not uh, airbrushed by those who are always keen to write people out of our history. Uh, Mr. Nihaus, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Professor Siepe, and thanks so much for having me on this particular event on uh, the Press Club South Africa. It is a great honor and pleasure to be here. I'm glad that you found the time. And uh, let me just uh, give you a bird's eye view on what we're going to try to cover. And I think uh, I'll start at the end to say the interview will end with a discussion around the new political initiative around the socio-economic transformation that you have started. But before that, I want... I still want you to take us through uh, your political journey. Well, let me first uh, put this. Um, if one were to ask you simply and briefly, who is Carl and, what, and how do you want it to be remembered? This should take you about three or four minutes. Thank you, Prof. Well, I'm an Afrikaner Bursian from what was in the old days known as the Western Transvaal. Today, it's the Northwest province. I grew up in a small town with the name of Zierist. By the way, the same town where President Jacob Zuma was arrested many years ago mm -hmm. and after that sentence to 10 years on the Robben Island. Yeah. Of course, I was very young when that happened. I didn't know that President Zuma was arrested there. We later on talk, talked about it and we had a good old chuckle about what happened there and the background of that very conservative Afrikaans small town where I come from. Mm. But what I think defined for me my, my sense of who I am was the decisions that I took from the age of 16 Mm -hmm. When I first became aware of the policy of apartheid, of course, that is in itself an indictment on the South African society that I only became aware mm -hmm. of the real consequences of apartheid at 16. When I, at the first time, visited Soweto, I was part of what was called a mission group of the Dutch Reformed Church, Mm -hmm. And I saw the massive differences, the huge discrepancies between the very comfortable lower white middle class existence that I had then because my father was transferred to Johannesburg. Then I was living in Witpurki in Johannesburg in Rudepurt. And I compared that very comfortable existence to what I saw in terms of the living conditions in Soweto and especially what I saw in the mining hostels that we visited, the terrible conditions, the terrible dinginess and poverty. Mm. And that made me to raise questions at that young age, questions which were not comfortable mm. for my Afrikaans community, the school that I went to, which was worse school, the Adlar in Witpurki, mm. and both my church and the school took great umbrage, took great exception to those questions that I raised. In fact, at the age of 17, the headmaster of Word School, the Adelaar, threatened to expel me from the school because mm. I questioned what was happened during the Soweto uprisings and said that I believed that the young people in Soweto absolutely had the right to rise up and that there were very good reasons for them to do so. So yeah. those were the issues that influenced me at a very young age. Okay. And then, Professor Siepe, at the age of 18, eventually, when I went to university, I started participating in university politics at the old Rand Afrikaans University, 
which today is known as the University of Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. I called for equal education for all. I called that the university should be opened to all South African citizens. And I think the worst thing, so to speak, that I did was to call for the release of President Nelson Mandela. And mm -hmm. after I put up some posters at the university, I was expelled from the university for having done so. So that's part of my early life and my okay. early background that eventually led me into the next phase of my life, yeah. which led to me joining the African National Congress. Yeah, yeah, because uh, the people who know a bit of your history know that you had a, a theological bent. Uh, you were more in a religious uh, community. But uh, what is it uh, about uh, the ANC that made you to see it as a, a viable vehicle to work uh, with to forge the type of society that you had in mind? Well, of course, initially I didn't, when I started developing the consciousness that apartheid was so fundamentally wrong, I didn't immediately join the African National Congress. Mm -hmm. But on that journey of investigating what was wrong in South Africa, I met an incredible man with the name of Dr. Bayers Nudia, Wembe. Mm -hmm. And Wembe became for me, as I've said many times, the father that my father could not be. Because when I was expelled from the Rand Afrikaans University, mm -hmm. my dad felt that it was such a shame that he threw me out of the house. And for a while, I was literally walking the streets and sleeping on park benches. I was a young Afrikaner boy. I didn't have a proper support network. I was yeah. still trying to find my feet. But fortunately, someone who I met, Father Simeon Nkwane, who was at that stage the dean mm. of the Anglican Cathedral, mm. um, he introduced me to the Reverend Bayer Shnudia to Umbe. And Umbe introduced me to many of the liberation fighters and leaders in South Africa, especially in the township of Alexandra, where Umbe was working as a co-priest in the Dutch Reformed Church in Africa, together with the Reverend Sam Booty. And that experience of being introduced into the community of Alexandra and working with people in Alexandra, being in that church had a massive impact on me. And I realized that the organization that the people truly trusted, believed in, and hoped for their liberation was the African National Congress. Okay. And I remember the day when I sat down with Mumbai in the back of his garden in his small house in Greenside, and I said to him, you know, Wembe, I think I must join the ANC. And there was this smile that flashed over his face. Mm. And I realized for the first time that Wembe was actually very closely associated with the ANC, although up to that point, he had never really said so to me. Yeah. Mm. And he said to me, look, if you want to join the ANC, I can make the necessary arrangements. And he did mm. do so. He arranged for me to cross the border into Botswana. I met with members of the African National Congress, among them someone who's still a close comrade of mine, Billy Matsetla. And yeah. I formally joined the ANC and I also decided, and this was extremely important for me. Yeah. I also decided that I had to join the armed wing of the African National Congress in Contuisiswe because my experience in Alexandra showed me that we were faced with such a terribly repressive system. Yeah. That there was so much violence and oppression mm. and that the black and especially African communities were subjugated to so much oppression by the apartheid regime mm. that I felt that we had reached a point where it was necessary for the armed struggle. So I felt that if I joined the ANC, it would only have integrity if I'm also prepared to stand up together with my fellow Black and African South Africans and fight the system also through the armed struggle. So that's yeah. how I joined both the ANC and Umkontu, he says, where in July 1979, 
at the yeah. age of 19. I think that's a very important um, history because today you do not find uh, many white people who are willing to acknowledge that they were supporters of apartheid. Actually, now everybody pretends that they, they were on the side of a liberation movement when in fact uh, that is not so. So the notion of a good white uh, who appears today is something that uh, I think the historians must uh, look at. Then you got arrested and you talked about um, an experience where you were tortured and uh, in the one instance you found yourself in the same shower with Obed Bapela. Could you just tell us a little bit about that? Well, I was arrested in 1983 and I still have very, very vividly in my mind that morning, it was very early in the morning when I woke up mm. and I looked down the barrel of an R5 submachine gun and the whole house was surrounded. The security police were literally swarming everywhere. So I was arrested, taken to the notorious John Foster Square, where I was detained in solitary confinement for a couple of months. And the interrogation was vicious. It was terrible. Mm. I was badly assaulted. I eventually lost track of what was happening in terms of time, whether it was day or night. Of course, one is in a cell that doesn't even allow you to see the light and the sunshine outside. The security police would come in the middle of the night and drag you off to the 10th floor of John Foster Square, beat you up, torture you, lock you up in a room where they play the loudest of sounds you can possibly imagine. Also sound and psychological torture. And yeah. one day when I was terribly beaten up, in fact, I was bleeding from my ears and bleeding from my nose. I was taken back to the cell and the policeman who was taking care of us in those cells took me to the shower to wash some of that blood off. Yeah. And I don't know if he did so deliberately or whether it was a mistake because some of those police were a little bit sympathetic to us. But Comrade Obert Papela was also detained with me because him and I worked together in the underground in Alexandra, was also brought into that shower. And we showered together. He was bleeding. I was bleeding. And I still have very vividly that memory of the blood that washed off our bodies and how it mixed and went down the drain in that shower, that very bare shower in which we stood. We couldn't really talk to each other, but in our eyes and in that communication between mm. us, we could share with each other. Yeah. And I must say that is a bond that has stayed between myself and Obed Papela up to this day. Of course, memories like that, you cannot forget. But yes, I yeah. was severely tortured. And so was also my then fiance, Yancy Lawrence, who later became mm. my first wife. Mm. She was, in fact, stripped naked. She was forced to stand for days on bricks. And at one point, the security police decided to force her to sing the old national anthem, the stem. Yeah. And they recorded her mm. singing that, singing it in tears, almost yeah. hysterical. And then mm. when I was taken back for interrogation, they played that recording back to me. Yeah. And they said to me, you better talk. Now, I'm proud. I never talked. I never betrayed any of my fellow comrades. But, you know, that memory of her singing this stem has stayed with me. Yeah. And, and that, that's one of important. those things. It was yeah, one that, of the important things that, that issue I, of uh, betrayal, uh, uh, Carl Neos, because uh, today we have uh, leaders uh, who cannot make the same claim. And there are claims that are made about some of the leaders who were actually sellouts. So the notion yeah. of not selling out, of course, you sold out from your own community, uh, the African community, when you took a stand against uh, apartheid. But the, something that uh, has always been interesting for people who had gone to prison, there are two things that happen. One, they come out very disillusioned, and some come out very emboldened. What is it about your experience? What made you not to be as disillusioned? And when I say that, I'm not talking about only 
the whites in the ANC. Actually, what we find now that some of the white people who are in the ANC have become the most racist and almost uh, apologists of the status quo. But uh, you remained and you came out to say you remain a member of the African National Congress and you continue to serve. But what is it that made you to continue to be that uh, fortified and committed? Well, I think it was two things. And I was about to tell you about that singing of the national and from the old stem, mm. because I realize how evil that system is. And even today, when I listen to our current national anthem, which is this hybrid anthem between Nkosi Sikilele, Africa, and the stem, I can never sing that part of the stem. Mm. Whenever I hear that part of that, what we now call our national anthem, I'm reminded of how Yancy was singing that part of the stem as she was tortured, as she was humiliated. So, why am I saying this, Prof? I'm saying it because my commitment to continue to fight was based on two things. Mm. The first one was my understanding of how fundamentally evil the apartheid system was and also the consequences of apartheid as it continued to play through in our society up to this very day. Mm. And the second part of it is that I decided to join the ANC because of a very clear understanding of the ideals that I wanted to promote. And it was not just the fight against racism. Yeah, it was yeah. also for economic equality and for economic liberation for all the people, especially Black and yeah. especially African. Yeah. And those ideals are the ideals that has driven me throughout my life. Prison never broke me. Prison made me even more committed that one had to fight apartheid. And you know, I remember the day when I was released from prison. It took me a long time to be released because the old apartheid government didn't want to release me because they thought of me as a fundamental Afrikaner Boer traitor. So most yeah. of the other um, political prisoners were already released by the time I was released. But the day when I was released, as we were driving to Johannesburg, I said to my family and to the people who were with me in the car, before I go home, take me to where the office now is of the recently unbanned African National Congress. I must go and appoint for duty. I must go and tell my fellow comrades, I'm out, I'm ready to work. And that is exactly what I did. And in fact, I started working the day after I was released in the Department of Information and Publicity of the ANC, which was a great privilege. And through that work, eventually, I was given the incredible privilege to become the national spokesperson of the ANC yeah. and also the spokesperson of President Nelson Mandela, which up to this day, I still cherish. Yeah, I think uh, really that is uh, probably one of the highlights of your political career and journey. But, um, you know, Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, these are giants. And uh, how did it feel to be in the presence of that greatness almost on a daily basis? As I say, it was an incredible privilege. And I learned so much from Adiba and also, and especially from Comrade Walter, who was one of the most humble, but at the same time, also one of the most incisive and decisive people I ever met in my life. You know, I traveled many places in the world with President Nelson Mandela. I was privileged to go with him to Oslo when he received the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. I was privileged that I was allowed to write the acceptance speech that oh, he delivered good. there. Yeah. And I've got a very clear memory of yeah. how President Mandela handled the very arrogant F.W. de Klerk. Yeah. Because a few days before he received the Nobel Peace Prize, we first went to Sweden. And in Sweden, in Stockholm, President Mandela delivered a speech in a banquet 
of the politicians and eminent leaders of Sweden. Yeah. And halfway through his speech, he started talking about what happened in prison. He started talking about the torture. For the first time, I heard him telling how he and fellow prisoners were forced to dig holes, get into those holes at that very notorious lime quarry, how they mm -hmm. were covered up to their necks with soil. And then when they were very thirsty, how some of the warders would stand and urinate on them. It was the first yeah. time I heard President Mandela talking about it. And yeah. if the clerk sat next to him stone-faced and angry because he felt that President Mandela speaking about these experiences was putting him in a bad light. Yeah, remember also then, the point that, you, that I want you to talk about is yeah. how even towards the end, it, the former president, de Klerk, had to be chastised by President Becky when mm. he wanted to suggest that apartheid was not a crime against humanity. That even at that time when he was receiving uh, the Nobel, he was still a supporter or an apologist of apartheid. Sure, he was. And he arrogantly that night, and that was about what I was going to tell you, that night after that banquet, he wrote a note to President Mandela saying to him, if you ever embarrass me like this, I will have to retaliate. And the next morning when I came to President Mandela's hotel room, and I still have that vivid memory of President Mandela standing on his knees, making his bed. You know, he always made his own bed. He never waited yeah. for any servant to make a bed for him. But then he showed me that note that the clerk had sent him. And I said to him, uh, uh, Mandiba, you should respond. You should react to the clerk. He said, no, don't worry, my boy. He always called me my boy. Yes. I have responded. I said, what did you say? I said, I simply wrote him a note back. Remember the last time when you tried to attack me at yeah. Kudesa? Don't try. So yeah. that was the firmness that there was sometimes from President Mandela. And as you quite correctly say, President Thabo Mbeke had to reprimand F.W. de Klerk. F.W. de Klerk was unrehabilitated. And I believe he remained unrehabilitated and he continued to support apartheid and try to justify apartheid until his last days, regardless of what anyone wanted to say. And one of the worst things for me was that President Cyril Ramaphosa decided to go and deliver the eulogy at F.W. de Klerk's funeral. It was a disgrace. Yeah, yeah we I hope you'll capture some of these issues in whatever you're going to write into the future. Because one of the things that I remember quite vividly is when uh, the former president, Nelson Mandela, talked about uh, what was done to them in prison, that uh, everything was taken away from them, even their sense of dignity. But yes. what they would not do, they were not going to control their mind and they were not going to end their respect. So these are some of the issues that unfortunately should uh, be part of this curriculum so as to remind people what uh, the sacrifices that people went through so that we can get to where we are. And maybe that would important them to go further to say the struggle continues. But then after that, you had the privilege of being among the first ambassadors uh, from South Africa to represent uh, the new nation. How was it like? It was an incredible privilege, and I'm still up to this day grateful to Madiba that he trusted me enough to send me to the Netherlands. Of course, the Netherlands was a complicated mission mm. because there's this history of apartheid from the Dutch as the Dutch colonists. Yeah. But at the same time, there was also the very strong anti-apartheid movement in the Netherlands that stood yeah. strongly against the apartheid regime. And you know, when I walked into the embassy the first day, I was surprised because the previous ambassador who was there was Zach de Beer. He was the first ambassador that mm -hmm. President Mandela sent after we became a democracy on the 27th of April, 1994. Mm -hmm. And as I walked in, 
There I saw a huge framed picture of Jan van Riebeek still hanging in the reception <laughs> of the embassy. And mm. I said, what on earth is going on here? How is this possible? Oh, said some of the other staff there, you know, we can't insult the people of the Netherlands to remove this picture. I said, well, it's an insult to me to see this picture on the wall, remove it now. And then mm. I went and I sent some of my staff, I said, let's get the most beautiful picture of Madiba and Queen Beatrix that yeah. we possibly can get. Take that uh, picture of the, uh, Van Riebeek out of the frame and put that picture of Madiba and Queen Beatrix in the frame. Mm. So that is what we did. And that silenced some of the staff because they couldn't really say anything because the Queen of the Netherlands was there together with yes, President yes. Mandela. Yeah. But yes, I tried my best to deliver the message that South Africa is a nation that must work for full liberation. Yeah. I also, in the time that I was there, even challenged people in the Netherlands about the racism that I continue to see there. And I must say that Queen Beatrix herself and her husband, Prince Klaus, were very mm. appreciative of those yeah. things that I did and said. And I built up a very good relationship with them. And so did Madiba have a very good relationship with Queen Beatrix. And we must never forget that the mother to Queen Beatrix, her mother was actually someone who severely criticized the parliament of the Netherlands mm -hmm. when they did not pass a, a legislation to fund the ANC and fund the anti-apartheid struggle. Yeah. And Queen Beatrix's mother who was then queen said, well, if you guys don't have the guts to do so, mm -hmm. Yeah. I will take my personal money and pay it to the ANC. Mm. And Queen Juliana did exactly that, which mm. is something which Madiba remembered. And I was very impressed when he mentioned it when he came on a state visit to the Netherlands in the formal banquet that we had also with the Dutch royal family. So the Dutch royal family always had a bit of a different disposition mm. to the position that the British royal family had. And I think they always were clear about their fundamental opposition to apartheid. Yeah. And then you came back uh, to the country at the time when the country or South Africa was losing its um, moral rectitude and uh, last uh, It was a time when we got embroiled in the debates around HIV AIDS at the time when there were questions around our support uh, of um, uh, what was happening, or I mean, claims of our support of what was happening in Zimbabwe. What, uh, were this the telltale sign that the, the ANC was uh, beginning to be on the wrong footing and on the wrong side of history? I'm afraid that some of that started happening when I was still ambassador in the Netherlands, especially that very, very wrong position that President Thabo and Mbeke had taken with regards to HIV AIDS and the consequences that so many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of South Africans died because of those positions that he held. Mm. And I was almost recalled because the last part of my time as ambassador in the Netherlands was under the presidency of yeah. President Mbeke. And I mm. refused to defend his HIV AIDS policy. And during that time, the then Minister of Health, Mantu Shabalala, came to the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And I refused to accept the statements that she was making and actually said, I do not agree with them. Mm -hmm. And after she went back to South Africa, I was given a very, very strong reprimand by the Department of International Relations which said to me, you must remember you represent the president of the republic. You can't have your own view. But I was never prepared to move away from my position that I did not agree with that position. But you're quite right that it was during that time that South Africa and the ANC started losing its moral high ground. I also think it was under President Thabo Mbeke that the new liberal economic policies and the policy of gear 
And this so-called mm. idea that wealth will trickle down from the wealthy mm. to the poor became prevalent and it was cemented into the thinking of our economic policy program. And it is a disaster that continued, that became worse, and it is a disaster that visits us today in this country. Those new liberal economic policies are continuing to drag this nation deeper and deeper into the abyss of poverty and that huge gap between the rich and the poor, which led to us being the most unequal society in the world. Yeah, uh, we are now, even the friends of the ANC, even the supporters of uh, President Ramaphosa have uh, been forced uh, to accept the reality that we are in the worst uh, economic crisis. And uh, also with um, the debilitating um, low shedding that we uh, have to deal with and the promises that we have uh, had since 2015, there's uh, still this notion of uh, nine wasted years. What's your take on that vis-a-vis uh, -vis what we are actually going through? Well, of course, it is pathetic propaganda. We must remember that under President Jacob Zuma, our economy was on a much stronger footing than what we see now. We must also remember that under President Zuma, we had one of the biggest infrastructural development programs, not just in South Africa, but in Africa and the world. And we must recall the role that President Zuma played and what he played also in terms of his commitment to the empowerment of especially small and medium-sized black businesses. I once listened to a young woman who was talking at a seminar and she talked about how that era of President Zuma empowered her, gave her the opportunity to be able to grow her small business. And then she bursted out in tears. And she said, but all of this has been destroyed under this administration of Cyril Ramaphosa. Suddenly, my ability to be able to grow this business has been removed from me. And you know, I was also listening to Mary Pardi, who is the president of the Truckers Association of South Africa. And she, on a different level, of course, on bigger businesses, was telling the same story. How TASA and how the black transport companies in South Africa were growing under President Zuma, how there were opportunities given to them, and how those opportunities have fallen away and had in fact been given back to white monopoly capitalist companies under President Cyril Ramaphosa and his administration. So this notion of nine wasted years is not experience by black African, South Africans, and black business people. In fact, the opposite is true. They are experiencing a wasteland today under Cyril Ramaphosa. And generally, African, South Africans are experiencing a situation where black economic empowerment is now under attack from Cyril Ramaphosa in Enoch Gordonwane. Yes, they say they pay lip service that they still want to do something around black economic empowerment, but we know that the legislation that are being pushed through, the manner in which they have agreed with the actions of solidarity and of those right-wing organizations, white organizations in South Africa that went to court and challenged black economic empowerment, that we are seeing Black people in South Africa being on the back foot everywhere, while yeah. white monopoly capitalism and white business is doing better than ever before, is more assertive and feel that they are truly in charge in this country. You can see that from the arrogance of the white business community. They feel that Cyril Ramaphosa is their man. He is representing them and he is preventing the majority of black South Africans from gaining control of our economy and being able to scale the commanding heights of this economy. Yeah, one of the things that we had hoped uh, for, Carl, those of us who are still oppressed, was the notion that says, um, come freedom. 
there'll be a reversal that the issues of inequalities will be a thing of the past. And uh, I'm reminded uh, of what uh, Vervoud is alleged to have said, that there will be a need to implement apartheid policy of separate development in such a way that no future government will be able to reverse that. And when you speak, I see almost uh, that we're going back to the apartheid days where being black means you remain landless, you remain hopeless, you will remain impoverished. You, I mean, these are really damning and it's damning for the ANC and the party that uh, you joined. And um, for me, how do you, and you, you continue to support the ANC. And this is something that some people could not understand because we speak so eloquently about its failures. What is it that uh, ultimately was the camel's back, uh, the, the straw that uh, broke the camel's back for you to say, now I've got to make peace with that past? Prof, I think what we have to acknowledge is that this selling out of the ideal of full liberation, which is not just liberation from racism, but also liberation from economic oppression, didn't just start after 1994. It started already in exile. There were those that infiltrated the African National Congress who were planted inside the ANC by imperialism and white monopoly capitalism to start that process. If you listen to what Ronnie Casuals does when he tells us about what happened in the mid 1980s, when an ANC delegation met for the first time with a delegation of the big captains of white monopoly capitalist industry in Lusaka. And he says, I was amazed how quickly that ANC delegation agreed that we are not going to change the fundamentals of the economic situation in South Africa. And of course, we saw that feeding through during the Codesa negotiations, and we especially saw it under those negotiations being led by Soro Ramaphosa. And we must remind ourselves that Ramaphosa was nurtured by white monopoly capitalism. I can recall what Irene Menno, the wife of Clive Menno, the owner of the second largest mining company in South Africa, Angloval, had to say. Mm. She said, we brought Cyril Ramaphosa into the Urban Foundation as a charitable act. But she said something even more important. She said, we brought him in as an insurance policy mm. for the future. And yeah. here we have it, these negotiations bound us into an economic policy program and also into the acknowledgement of property rights, the Section 25 part of our Constitution, the sunset clauses, all of those things that made it impossible to truly bring fundamental economic change. Now your question, why did I, despite all of this, and I saw it happening, stay in the ANC? Mm. Because I believed still that there were many men and women of great commitment and courage and principle in the ANC. And I kept on appealing to those comrades that we must bring about the change, to work for the change, to mobilize. And I still believe that the majority of people at a grassroots level in the African National Congress are truly people who believe in this dream of full economic liberation as part of the second phase of our national democratic revolution. But sadly, the current leadership of the ANC, especially those now that surfaced under Cyril Ramaphosa as part of those plants that were inside the ANC for a long time, that have surfaced and hollowed out the ANC and actually turned the ANC into what I call a Trojan horse for new liberalism, and for white monopoly capitalism. They are the ones that have destroyed the African National Congress. And actually, today you see how the general population in South Africa still emotionally react to the colors of the ANC and the logo of the ANC, because they recall that illustrious liberation history of the ANC. 
But in the most cynical of ways, Cyril Ramaphosa and his acolytes are abusing that love and that support for the ANC in order to use the ANC now as an instrument of comprador capitalism, of being the policemen and women for white monopoly capitalism in this country. And I reached the point where I said, look, if this is continuing, if I have to see Cyril Ramaphosa and his leadership coming back after the 55th National Conference of the ANC, if I have to watch how they refuse to implement the official economic policy program of the ANC, which is radical economic transformation, mm -hmm. how they go out of their way and find every possible excuse not to do expropriation of land without compensation, not to nationalize the South African Reserve Bank and not to change our financial economic institutions, I will not be able to continue to stay in the ANC. So by yeah. the time that that decision came through, that horrible, uh, I call it a sham election that took place now just a few days ago, about a month ago, at the 55th National Conference of the ANC, where Ramaphosa came back once again on the back of bribes and brown envelopes and manipulation of the administrative and elective processes in the ANC. I said to myself, look, you have to have integrity. You said uh, you will not be able to live with this any further. Uh, Carl, you let me ask you a, a different question. What uh, is your response to those who, says, who say, if you were not expelled, you would have remained within the ANC? I know you have uh, tried to communicate uh, that before, but I still want you to deal with it. Hmm. Look, I was expelled in the most illegal of ways and against the ANC constitution for ridiculously trumped up charges. Hmm. That expulsion was publicly announced even without informing me. I've never even received a formal letter from the National Disciplinary Committee of the ANC. But the point that those who tried to make this allegation that I would have stayed in the ANC if I was not expelled, do not understand, is that I appealed immediately. Mm. I appealed, and in terms of the ANC constitution, when you appeal, the status quo remains. Mm. So that means that my membership was immediately on the back of that appeal reinstated. Yeah. And I was a full member of the ANC, I was yeah. actually entitled to go to the National Conference of the ANC. I was entitled to be a delegate from my branch. Yeah. But these ANC administrators who do not care for their own constitution and do not care for the law, mm. when I went to the accreditation center and asked for my accreditation, refused to give it to me. Mm. Now, I remained in until this decision came out as I explained to you, that Ramaphosa is back, that the decisions of the conference led to a rollback of the radical economic transformation policy program of the ANC. And at that point, I said, and I took the decision, no one took that decision for me. Yeah. I said, yes, I'm now still a member of the ANC on the back of the fact that I have appealed, but yeah. I'm withdrawing my appeal. Yeah, let me. Put the, I am no longer prepared to be a member sure. of this organization. I said then the ANC is dead, and I said I did not leave the ANC. Yeah, is the ANC. So, let, let me ask you a new question. You are um, a great supporter of uh, the former president uh, Jacob Zuma, and if you listen to him carefully, he is uh, always of the view that we must not confuse uh, the current leadership that he also is of the view that it is sold out with the movement. And uh, you have abandoned or you have left or the ANC or it has left you, whichever way you look at it. And we've seen how the ANC is actually performing. I mean, it's non-performing. Well, I mean, whether you're talking about in government, but also in terms of the, of the dwindling uh, support that is uh, almost uh, continuing. 
would you be, are you among those like uh, Khalima Mukante, the former deputy president of the ANC and the country who says, maybe it might be better for the ANC to visit elections? Are you also holding that view? Let me start off with the first part of the question that you asked, and that is the view that President Zuma holds, that there is a difference between the leadership of the ANC and the ANC's organization. Yeah. I've also ascribed to that view up to the point where I realized that this ANC that we have now has been destroyed to such an extent hmm. by this current leadership that it no longer can be the instrument of liberation, that it has become an instrument of oppression, mm -hmm. and that those who were the best of will remain in the ANC and who still try to implement the original ideals of the ANC are actually finding themselves in an abusive relationship. They are being abused, they are being used to give credibility to an organization which is not the organization that I have joined and is not the organization that was created in 1912 with the ideals for full liberation, the return of the land and everything else that I've referred to. So yeah. I'm sad to say, I've reached a point where I said, the ANC as it exists today is not the same ANC that I belong to and that I dedicated my life to. Yeah. Now I have sympathy for the position that President Zuma holds because he is a person who dedicated his whole life to the liberation struggle and to the ANC. He is 80 years old now. Yeah. I will never pass harsh judgment on him when he says he cannot leave the ANC. But I think those are the operative words. It's not that it is the correct thing to stay, but yeah. in his heart of hearts, he cannot leave. Yeah. And that is, for me, the tragedy of many of the comrades in the ANC who stay there because they still have this forlorn hope that this organization will change, that this organization will bring about, again, the resurrection of those erstwhile ideals of full liberation and the true revolutionary heart of the ANC. I'm afraid it is over. I'm afraid yeah. the ANC is dead. And so yes, you are in agreement ask, with I'm the... not talking like, wait, I just want to make this point. I'm not talking okay. like Halima Motante. Okay. I don't want to simply see the ideals of the ANC lost in an election. Okay. I want to see those ideals being held on to, being promoted, being worked for. Mm -hmm. And that is why when I eventually decided that I'm resigning from the ANC, I couldn't just let it there. Yeah. I had to start to work for the continuation of those ideals, the continuation of the ideals for radical economic transformation that I believe is historically part of the ANC right from its beginning up to the point where it yeah. was betrayed by this thing that is called the ANC today, but it's no longer the ANC. And therefore, I am working for the full rollout of a movement called the Radical Economic Transformation Movement, which holds those ideals for yeah. radical economic transformation, which was originally part of the ANC's economic policy program dearly and will work for its implementation, hopefully in a very practical way, on community level, within our municipalities and within our country, and that it will truly help to change the lives of our people. Yeah. What I find also fascinating about the history, which uh, probably you'll have to capture, is that under apartheid, the ruling party saw you as a persona non grata. Now the current uh, ANC and the ruling party sees you as a persona non grata. It's almost like uh, it completes uh, the cycle that you have ended where you started, being a persona non grata of a, a ruling party. What, how do you, don't you find that the, uh, a tragic uh, irony of history? No, I don't find it an irony. I find it actually an affirmation of the principles for which I joined yeah. the African National Congress in the first place. You know, I 
debated with a very dear comrade of mine who said to me, no, you shouldn't have left the ANC. And I said, my dear comrade, the same reasons why I joined the ANC, the reasons for full liberation are the same reasons that brought me to the point where I had to say to this leadership, to Cyril Ramaphosa, I'm leaving because I cannot associate myself with the selling out that you are indulging in. So for me, it is a confirmation sure. of those same ideals. So it's not tragic. No, no I think I, I like it. Yeah. For the future yeah. on which I want to build the rest of my life. I'm 63 now. I have a couple of years where I can still be active and I can make my contribution. And I want to make that contribution in line with those same ideals that that very young man at yeah, the sure. age of 19 joined in 1979. I'm sticking to those ideals. Okay. And now at this age, I'm going to continue to fight for them as hard as I fought for them then. Yeah, the, this question um, is almost inevitable. Uh, it's a question around what will make uh, this political and social formation that you're talking about different from the COPEs of this world, from the UDMs of this world, and from other offshoots. At least we know that uh, uh, the EFF has, uh, when, it, uh, when Malema started it, he defined himself outside the ANC. He was not, uh, they were not defining themselves as um, uh, almost uh, people who are disgruntled and they live at the, as a result of disgruntlement. They started a new formation with its own uh, program. I mean, if you remember the COPE, it began even to claim that it represents the real ANC. But the, how will this movement differ from the others? And uh, would it not have been better for you to have um, worked with uh, the EFF because they also are um, into the notion of uh, economic liberation and total emancipation of our people? Prof, I think the first thing that we need to say is that I have no intention for this radical economic transformation movement to be a reactionary movement against the ANC. Yeah. And it is only because of this early part, so recently that I've left the ANC, that I still speak about me having left the ANC. Mm -hmm. But what I really want to talk about is about the future. Yeah. and about how we can transform our society and build an economic program which is founded, which is on the foundation of radical economic transformation. Now, you're quite right to say that the ideals of radical economic transformation finds itself expressed in the EFF, in the ATM, and in some other political parties to the left of the African National Congress. That is true. Yeah. But what I would like to see is that we create now a movement. I'm not launching a political party. Sure. Yeah. I'm creating a movement which is going to work for the fundamental implementation of radical economic transformation. As I've expressed it today on the return of the land, the reserve bank that should be nationalized, fundamental economic transformation. And to find common cause... Yeah. with all of those in other political parties and also civil society formations that agree on the radical economic transformation. That's why I want it to be a movement so that members of other political parties can be part of this movement, mm -hmm. that we can work together to have a minimum program of action, whether it's going to be a seven-point or ten-point plan, that we will work out, but a yeah. minimum program of action where all of us can work together. And our first and most important task is not to be reactionary to the African National Congress, but to be true to those ideals, to work for the implementation of those ideals, and to do it on a mass people basis. So that's why I said this radical economic transformation movement must be founded not just at a national level, but at a provincial, at a regional, and at a local, at a municipal level. 
And we must address the needs of our people in very practical ways, but on the basis of those principles of radical economic transformation. Now, I know, and I want to address this immediately. Mm. There are those who have a negative view about radical economic transformation because there's been so much negative propaganda against RET. But you know, Prof, there is a saying, an old African saying, which says a hyena, when it wants to eat its children, yeah. first accuses them of smelling like goats. <laughs> and that is exactly what these sellout leaders of the African National Congress was doing with the policy program of radical economic transformation. It tried to cast it in the context of being corrupt, which was a lie. It tried to cast it in the context of something which it is not at all in terms of that it wants to enrich and empower just a few corrupt people. While it knew very well that this is an economic policy program that if it is truly implemented, it will pull the rug from underneath their feet it will destroy that white monopoly capitalist base on which they have also found their wealth because they have become the comprador capitalists for those big white monopoly capitalist companies. And they had to destroy it. They had to also fight radical economic transformation in its perception, in the way that the general public will think about it and destroy the name and the integrity of RIT. Yeah. But I want to make this point. Some people say to me, but you shouldn't call this movement the radical economic transformation movement because there is so much negativity that had been generated through STRATCOM programs and through white monopoly capitalist media attacks, etc. And I said, no, radical economic transformation is exactly what we want. And we are going to rehabilitate that concept, we are going to make it become true through the actions that we take. And yeah. we're going to work with other political parties to do exactly that. And we're going to counter, to come back to that yeah. African I, saying, I think we're, Aina, we're going to counter those Ayinas who want to eat their own children. Yeah, actually the ideas that are being propounded against the radical economic transformation are sad and uh, despicable, considering that black people at the moment still are still the pariahs in the land of their birth, no different than the, they were in 1918. And uh, for any black person to stand and oppose that, it tells you that Vervute was very successful in exactly. turning a black person into a fourth class, class citizen in, in his own country. Now, one last question. You have been in and out, out of the courts, uh, both as a, supporters of, a supporter of those who are implicated and also as an implicated person. What is your take on our judicial system? Well, you know the reason, the ostensible reason why the National Executive Committee of the ANC charged me and the National Disciplinary Committee of the ANC tried to expel me was because I said that our courts are captured and that there is a serious problem that many of the judiciary have become agents of a factional group within the ANC and within our government. And that belief I hold very, very strong. Mm. And I hold it on the basis of asking myself, how is it that President Cyril Ramaphosa, through the CR17 bank statements, mm. has managed to close those statements, has mm. gone out of his way together with friends in the judiciary to mm. seal them because they do not want to reveal where money went. And I'm still of the opinion that there is a massive chance that some of that money went to the judiciary and some of the judges in this country. I find it also extraordinary that we could have had a constitutional court judgment on the basis of a legal procedure, not even a court case, mm. 
that sentenced President Jacob Zuma to 15 months of imprisonment on the basis of flimsy charges, which even two eminent judges in a minority judgment of that constitutional court said is unconstitutional. And in fact, they said it contravenes in even international law. Recently, just yesterday, we had an incredible judgment from a full bench of the Gauteng High Court in Johannesburg, giving President Ramaphosa the urgency request, the urgency interdict that he requested with regards to that very important and serious private prosecution that President Zuma brought against Sir Ramaphosa. Now you ask yourself, how do the judges get to the point of saying that it is novel for President Ramaphosa to be charged in his official capacity for the official position that he holds? Well, they know very, very well that the Secretary General of the ANC, Comrade Ace Magashule, has been charged on the basis of what he is purported to have had to do in his official capacity as the Premier of the Free State on a so-called oversight charge. So you see, what we deal with in these judiciary of ours today is selective judgments, yeah. selective application of the law on the basis of factional politics. And I have maintained throughout that selective justice is not justice at all. It is fundamentally injustice. And I said yesterday, if there is one sector of our society that will end up destroying this constitutional democracy that we have tried to establish, mm is our judiciary. Yeah. Mr. Kaldihaus, uh, thank you very much uh, for making the time. And uh, I think uh, your activism is something that has been noted. And uh, I know that um, some groupings have even called you uh, a warrior, a Zulu warrior, as a way of appreciation of your contribution. But uh, for, from the position of a uh, Press Club uh, South Africa, we want to thank you for making the time and for giving us this uh, comprehensive um, journey that you have actually traversed. And I hope that uh, this will become part of uh, the history and the book that you are going to write. So with this, I'm saying it's an assignment that I'm sure you'll deliver. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us at this end our most uh, scintillating interview with Mr. Carl uh, thank, thank you so much. Paul. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who listened. And may I make, uh, I'm going to abuse this opportunity to call on my fellow South Africans to join the radical economic transformation movement as a commitment to save our country and to make sure that our children will truly have a future. Thank you very much. Adios.